This has got a lot of F's for me. <laughs> this is old English, so you notice the difference in spelling. <laughs> Are there any other copies, or have they all gone out? Gone? Gone? Much to my surprise, they're already gone. There are 15 copies. Sure. I've got one at home. <laughs> Did you see how fast that was? Keep the light on that man. It's called divesting. It's called the divestiture. She refuted me with the same arguments I have made use of to refute Agatha, <coughs> proving to me that love, according to my own account of him, was neither beautiful nor good. How say you, Diatima? Then said I, is love an ugly and an evil being? Soft, replied she, no abusive language. Do you imagine that every being who is not beautiful must of course be ugly? Without doubt, answered I. And every being who is not wise, said she, do you conclude it must be ignorant? 
Do you not see there is something between wisdom and ignorance? I ask her what that could be. To think of things rightly as being what they really are, without being able to assign a reason why they are such. Do you not perceive, said she, that this is not to have science or true knowledge of them? For where the cause or reason of a thing remains unknown, how can there be a science? Nor yet is it ignorance. For that which errs not from the truth, how could that be ignorance? Such then is right opinion, something between wisdom and ignorance. You are certainly in the right, said I. Deem it not necessary then, said she, that what is not beautiful should be ugly, or that what is not good must of consequence be evil. To apply this to the case of love, though you have agreed, he is neither good nor beautiful, yet imagine not that he must ever the more on that account be ugly and evil, but something between those opposites. Well, said I, but he is acknowledged by all to be a powerful God, however. By all who know him, do you mean, said she, or by all who know him not? By all, universally, replied I. Upon which she smiled and said, How, Socrates, should he be acknowledged a powerful God by those who absolutely deny his divinity? Who are they, said I. You yourself, replied she, are one of them, and I am another. Explain your meaning, said I. My meaning, said she, is easy to be explained. For answer me to this question. Say you not that the gods are, all of them, blessed and happy? Or would you offer to say of any one of the gods that he was not blessed and happy being, not a blessed and happy being? Not I, for my part, said I, by Jupiter. By a happy being, said she, do you not mean a being possessed of things fair, beautiful, and good? It is granted, answered I. And you granted before, said she, that love from his indigence and want of things good and beautiful desired those things of which he was destitute. I allowed it. How then, said she, can he be a god, he who is destitute of things fair, beautiful, and good? And it appears, said I, that he by no means can. You see then, said she, that even in your own judgment, love is no god. What, said I, must love then be mortal? Far from that, replied she. Of what nature was he then, I ask her? Of like kind, answered she, with those natures we have just now been speaking of, an intermediate one, between the mortal and the immortal. But what in particular, O Diatuna? A great daemon, replied she, for the daemon kind is of an intermediate nature between the divine and the human. What is the power and virtue, said I, of this intermediate kind of being? To transmit and to interpret to the God, said she, yes. what comes from men, and to men, in like manner, what comes from the gods. From men their petitions and their sacrifices. From the gods in return, the revelation of their will. Thus, these beings, standing in the middle, rank between divine and human. Fill up the vacant space and link together all intelligent nature. Through their intervention proceeds every kind of divination and priestly art relating to sacrifices and the mysteries and incantations with the whole of divination and magic. For divinity is not mingled with man, but by means of that middle nature is carried on all converse and communion, communication between the gods and mortals, whether in sleep or waking. 
whoever has wisdom and skill in things of this kind is a demoniacal man. And knowing and skillful in any other thing, whether in the arts or certain manual operations, are illiberal and sordid. These daemons are many and various. One of them is love. But, said I, from what parents was he born? The history of his parentage, replied she, is somewhat long to relate. However, I will give you the relation. At the birth of Venus, the gods, to celebrate that event, made a feast, at which was present, amongst the rest, plenty, the son of council. After they had supped, poverty came a begging, and abundance of dainties being there, and loitered about the door. Just then plenty, intoxicated with nectar, for as yet wine was not, went out into the gardens of Jupiter, and oppressed with the load of liquor that he had drunk, fell asleep. Poverty, therefore, desiring through her indigence to have a child for plenty, artfully lay down by him and, came, and became the child and became with child of love. Hence it is that love is the constant follower and attendant of Venus, as having been begotten on the birthday of that goddess, being also by his natural disposition fond of all beauty, he is the more attached to Venus herself on account of her being beautiful. Now, as love is the son of plenty and of poverty, the condition of his life and fortune is as follows. In the first place, he is always poor, and as far from being either fair or tender as the multitude imagine him, for he is rough and hard and dry, without shoes to his feet and without a house or any covering to his head, always groveling on the earth and lying on the bare ground, at doors and in the streets, in the open air, partaking thus of his mother's disposition and living in perpetual want. On the other hand, he derives from his father's side qualities very different from those others. For hence it is that he is full of designs upon the good and the fair. Hence it is that he is courageous, sprightly, and prompt to action, a mighty sportsman always contriving some new device to entrap his game, much addicted to thought and fruitful in expeditions, expedients. All his life philosophizing, powerful in magic and enchantment, no less so in sophistry. His nature is not mortal, or the common way of mortality, nor yet is it immortal, after the manner of the immortal gods. For sometimes, in one and the same day, he lives and flourishes, when he happens to fare well and presently afterwards he dies, and soon after that revives again as partaking of his father's nature. Whatever abundance flows in upon him is continually stealing away from him, so that love is never absolutely in a state, either of affluence or of indigence. Again, he is seated in the middle between wisdom and ignorance, for the case is this with regard to wisdom. None of the gods philosophize or desire to become wise, for they are so. So there be, so if there be, yeah. and if there be any other being beside the gods who is truly wise, neither does such a being philosophize, nor yet does philosophy or the search of wisdom belong to the ignorant. For in this very account is the condition of ignorance so wretched that notwithstanding, she is neither fair, good, nor wise, yet she thinks she has no need of any kind of amendment or improvement, so that the ignorant, not imagining themselves in need, seek, neither seek nor desire that which they think they want not. Who are they then, O Diotima, said I, who philosophize, if they are neither the wise nor the ignorant? 
for that is evident, said she. Even a child may now discover that they must be such as stand in the middle rank of being, in the number of whom is love. For wisdom is among the things of highest beauty, and all beauty is the object of love. It follows, therefore, of necessity that love is a philosopher or a lover of wisdom, and that as such he stands between the adept in wisdom and the wholly ignorant. This as well as all the rest of his condition is owing to his parentage, as he derives his birth from a father wise and rich in all things, and from a mother unwise and in want of all things. Such, dear Socrates, is the nature of this daemon. But that you had other thoughts of that being whom you took for love is not at all surprising. For if I may guess from the description you gave of him yourself, you seem to have taken for love that which is beloved, not that which loves. And from this mistake it arose, as I imagine, that love appeared to you in all respects so beauteous. For the object of love, the amiable, is truly beauteous and delicate, is perfect and completely blessed. But to the subject of love, the lover, belongs a different nature, such a one as I have described to you. Be it granted such, Diotima, said I, for what you tell me bids fair to be the truth. But now, such being his nature, of what advantage is he to humankind? This, Socrates, said she in the next place, I shall do my best to teach you. <coughs> Already, then it appears, what kind of being love is, and of what parents he was born and that his object is beauty, you yourself have asserted. Now, what answer shall we make should we be asked this question? O Socrates and Diotima, how or in what respect mean ye when you say that beauty is the object of love? To express the meaning of my question in plainer terms, she said, what is it which the lover of beauty longs for? Your answer, said she, draws on a further question. What will be the state or condition of that man who is in possession of his beloved beauty? I told her I could, I could by no means answer readily to such a question. <coughs> Suppose then, said she, that changing the subject of the question and putting good in the place of beauty, one were to ask you thus and say, answer me, Socrates, to this question. What is it which the lover of good, of good longs for? To be in possession of that good, answered I. And what, she asked me again, will be the state of the man who is in possession of good? This, said I, is a question I can answer with much less difficulty, thus, that such a man will be happy. Right, said she, for by the possessing of good things, it is that the happy are in that happy state which they enjoy. Nor is there any room to question further and ask why or for the sake of what a man wishes to be happy, but, to, but a conclusive answer appears to have been given fully satisfactory. True, said I, without dispute. Now this wishing and this longing, said she, let me ask you, whether in your opinion it is common to all men, whether you think that all wish to be always in possession of things good, or how otherwise? I think just so, replied I, that such a wish is common to all. Well then, Socrates, said she, must we not acknowledge that all men are in love, seeing that the affections of them all are always fixed on the same things? Or shall we say that some are in love and some are not? It is a thought, said I, which I confess a little surprises me. Be not surprised, said she, for the case is nothing more than this, 
that the name of love, which belongs to all love in general, we appropriate to one particular kind of love, singled out from the others, which we distinguish by other names. To make me conceive the meaning more perfectly, said I, cannot you produce some other case parallel to this? I can, said she, the following case is parallel. Making or creating, you know, comprehends many kinds of operations. For all cause by which anything proceeds out of non-being into being is creation. So that all the operations and all the works executed through any of the arts are indeed so many creations. And all the artists and all the workmen are real creators, makers, or poets. True, said I. And yet you know, continued she, they are not all of them called poets or makers, but are distinguished by different names. Whilst one particular kind of creation, that which is performed in meter through the muses' art is singled out from the other kinds, and the name to which they have all an equal right is given to that alone. For that alone is called poetry, posy or making, and the artists in this species of creation only are particularly are peculiarly distinguished by the name of poets or makers. Perfectly right, said I. Just so is it then in the case of love, said she. Universally, all desire of good things, of things good, and all that longing after happiness, which is in every individual of humankind, is the mighty deity of love, who by secret ways and stratagems subdues and governs the hearts of all. His votaries, in many various ways, such as those engaged in the pursuit of wealth or strength of body or wisdom, are not said to be in love, nor is the name of lover allowed to any such, but to those only who are devoted to love in one particular way and add themselves to one certain species of love, we appropriate those terms of love and lovers and the being in love which ought to be considered as general terms, applicable and common to all the different kinds. In all appearance, said I, you are entirely in the right. She proceeded, however, to confirm the truth of what she said in the following manner. There is a saying, continued she, that lovers are in search of, their other, of the other half of themselves. But my doctrine is, that we love neither the half nor even the whole of ourselves, if it happen not, my friend, some way or other to be good. For we are willing to have our feet and our hands cut off, though our own, if we deem them incurably or absolutely evil. It is not to what is their own that men have so strong an attachment, nor do they treat it so tenderly on that account. Unless there be a man who thinks good to be his own and properly belonging to him, but evil to be foreign to his nature. So true it is that there is no other object of love to man than good alone. Or do you think there is? By Jupiter, said I, there appears to me no other. Is this now sufficient for us, said she, and have we done justice to our argument if we finish it with this simple and slender conclusion that all men love what is good? And why not, said I. What, said she, must we not add this, that they long to have possession of the loved good? This, said I, must be added, and not only now to have possession of it, said she again, but to have possession of it forever, too. Must not this be added further? This further, said I. Love, then, in fine, said she, is the desire of having good and perpetual possession. Could I interrupt? Mm -hmm. 
have a question. Please go back to him. The thought came to me is that if love looks upon the beloved and the beloved is beautiful, the love is looking at it through his eyes. The love it doesn't necessarily mean it's beautiful. You mean it's only beautiful to the lover? The beloved? Well, isn't it true? Is that what it's saying here? No, it's not what it's saying there. It's right. saying that the lover sees the beloved as beautiful. That, that, the, that the beloved is the thing that is beautiful and desired. <coughs> You know, uh, does he add to I'm that? Driving it. Yeah, does he add to that though at the bottom of 504, top of 505? Good. 504? It's a, yeah, it's a judgment, isn't it? Because he adds to it, not only it's beautiful, but it must be perceived by the lover to be good. Mm -hmm. of love to man than good alone. The only thing I'm saying is, is that the beloved in the eye of the holder is beautiful. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily mean it is beautiful. Sure. Yeah, I'm adding to that. But it's not merely a perception, a perception it's also a judgment. That's what I'm The judgment being of the beloved is good. And if it isn't regarded as good, no one wants it. I mean, one has to discover some good in the object that one loves, otherwise. Doesn't mean that it's good just because someone sees it as good. That's true. That's true. Okay. That's all right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, why don't we uh, jump to uh, the steps? Huh? Mm -hmm. Do the steps carefully. See how different it is. Mm -hmm. On 111. Does that strike you as fair? On 111? 511. Okay. There to go on? Yeah. Yeah. Come in the mysteries. 513, I'm sure. We have another problem with 513. Oh. <laughs> In the mysteries of love thus far, perhaps, Socrates, you may be initiated and advanced. You have that on 511? In the mysteries of love thus far, perhaps, Socrates, you may be initiated and advanced. But to be perfected and to attain the intuition <coughs> of what is secret and inmost, introductory to which is all the rest, if undertaken and performed <coughs> with a mind rightly disposed, I doubt whether you may be able. However, said she, not to be wanting in a readiness to give you thorough information, I will do my best to conduct you till we have reached the end. 
but do you your best to follow me. Whoever then enters upon this great affair in a proper manner and begins according to a right method must have been from his earliest youth conversant with bodies that are beautiful. Prepared by this acquaintance with beauty, he must in the first place, if his leader, lead a right. Fall in love with some one particular person, fair and beauteous, and on her beget fine sentiments and fair discourse. He must afterwards consider that the beauty of outward form, that which he admires so highly in his favorite fair one, is sister to a beauty of the same kind, which he cannot but see in some other fair. In some other fair. If he can then pursue this corporeal beauty and trace it wherever it is to be found throughout the human species, he must want understanding not to conceive that beauty is one and the same in all beauteous bodies. With this conception in his mind, he must become a lover of all visible forms which are partakers of this beauty. And in consequence of this general love, he must moderate the excess of that passion for one only female form which had hitherto engrossed him wholly. For he cannot now entertain thoughts extravagantly high of the beauty of any particular fair one, a beauty not particular to her, but which she partakes of in common with all other corporeal forms that are beauteous. After this, if he thinks rightly and knows to estimate the value of things justly, he will esteem that beauty which is inward and lies deep in the soul to be of greater value and worthy of more regard than that which is outward and adorns only the body. Assume, therefore, as he meets with the person of a beauteous soul and generous nature, though flowering forth but a little in superficial beauty, with this little he is satisfied. He has all he wants. He truly loves and assiduously employs all his thoughts and all his care on the object of his affection. Researching in his mind and memory, he draws forth, he generates such notions of things, such reasonings and discourses as may best improve his beloved in virtue. Thus he arrives, of course, to view beauty in the arts the subjects of discipline and study, and comes to discover that beauty is congenial in them all. He now, therefore, counts all beauty corporeal to be of mean and inconsiderable value as being but a small and inconsiderable part of beauty. From the arts he proceeds further to the sciences and beholds beauty no less in these. And by this time, having... Mm-hmm. Last two pages, the type. Mm-hmm. And by this time, having seen and now considering within himself that beauty is manifold and glorious, he is no longer like one of our domestics who has conceived a particular affection for some child of the family, a mean and illiberal slave to the beauty of any one particular, whether person or art study or practice, but betaking himself to the ample sea of beauty and surveying it with the eye of intellect, he begets many beautiful and magnificent reasonings and dionoetic conceptions in prolific prolific in prolific philosophy till being strengthened and increased He perceives what the one science is which is so singularly great as to be the science of this singular great a beauty. But now try, continued she, to give me all the attention you are master of. Mm -hmm. Whoever... thus advances 
whatever it is. Hmm. Thus far in the mysteries of love by a right and regular progress on contemplation. Approaching now to perfect intuition, suddenly he will discover, bursting into view, a beauty astonishingly admirable. That very beauty to the gaining a sight of which the aim of all his preceding studies and labors had been directed. A beauty whose peculiar character, whose peculiar characters are these. In the first place, it never had a beginning, nor will ever have an end, but always is, and always flourishes in perfection, unsusceptible of growth or of decay. In the next place, it is not beautiful only when looked at one way or seen in one light, at the same time that, viewed in another way or seen in some other light, it is far from being beautiful. It is not beautiful only at certain times or with reference only to certain circumstances of things, being at other times or when things are otherwise circumstanced, quite the contrary, nor is it beautiful only in some places or as it appears to some persons, whilst in other places and to other persons its appearance is the reverse of beautiful. Nor can this beauty, which is indeed no other than the beautiful itself, ever be the object of imagination, as if it had some face or hands of its own, or any other parts belonging to the body. Nor is it some particular reason nor some particular science. It resides not in any other being, not in any animal, for instance, nor in the earth, nor in the heavens, nor in any animal, nor in any other part of the universe. (coughs) But simple and separate from other things, it subsists alone with itself and possesses an essence eternally uniform. All other forms which are beauteous participate of this, but in such a manner they participate that by their generation or destruction this suffers no diminution, receives no addition, nor undergoes any kind of alteration. When from these lower beauties, reascending by the right way of love, a man begins to gain a sight of this supreme beauty, he must have almost attained somewhat of his end, Now to go or to be led by another along the right way of love is this, beginning from those beauties of lower rank, to proceed in the continual ascent, all the proposing this highest beauty as the end, and using the rest, but as so many steps in the ascent, to proceed from one to two, from two to all beauteous bodies, from from the beauty of bodies, to that of souls, from the beauty of souls to that of to that of arts, from the beauty of arts to that of disciplines, until at length from the disciplines he arrives <coughs> at the dis- at the discipline which is the discipline of no other thing than that of supreme beauty, and thus finally attains to know what is the beautiful itself. Here is to be found, dear. Socrates, said the strange prophetess, here of anywhere the happy life, the ultimate object of desire to man. It is to live in beholding this consummate beauty, the sight of which, if ever you attain, it will appear, not to be in gold, not in magnificent attire, nor in beautiful youths or damsels. (coughs) With such, however, as at present, many of you are so entirely taken up and with the sight of them so absolutely charmed that you would rejoice to spend your whole lives where possible in the presence of those enchanting objects without any thoughts of eating or drinking but feasting your eyes only with their beauty and living always in the bare sight of it if this be so what effect think you would the sight of beauty itself have upon a man 
for he to see it pure and genuine, not corrupted and stained all over with the mixture of flesh and colors, and much more of light perishing and fading trash, but were able to view that divine essence, the beautiful itself, in its own simplicity of form. Think you, said she, that the life of such a man would be contemplative or mean? To the man who always directed his eye toward the right object, who, I don't know what that looked, word is. Looked. Who looked always at real beauty and was conversant with it continually. Perceive you not, said she, that in beholding the beautiful with that eye, with which alone it is possible to behold it, thus and thus only, could a man ever attain to generate not the images or semblances of virtue as not having his intimate commerce with a image or a semblance but virtue true, real, and substantial from the converse and embraces of that which is real and true. Thus begetting true virtue and bringing her up till she is grown mature, he would become a favorite of the gods and at length would be, if any man ever be, himself one of the immortals. The doctrines which I have now delivered to you, Phaedrus, and to the rest of my friends here, I was taught by the Athena, and I am persuaded they are true. For of this persuasion myself, I have endeavored to persuade others. Full of this persuasion myself, I have endeavored to persuade others and to show them that it is difficult for any man to find a better guide or assistant to him than love in his way to happiness. And on this account I further counted that every man ought to pay all due honors to that patron of human nature. For my own part, I make it my chief study to cultivate the art of which love teaches and employ myself upon the subjects proper for the exercise of that art with a particular attention, encouraging others to follow my example, and at all times as well as now, celebrating the power and virtue of love as far as I am able. This speech, Phaedrus, you may accept, if you are so pleased, for a panegyric in praise of love, or if you choose to call it by any other name and to take it in any other sense, be that its name, be that its right, be that its right name and that its proper accept, exception. <coughs> sure is makes many more an interesting distinction than Ross makes. He sees, right? He sees far better. Makes far more interesting distinctions. Look at that type, type page, first one. <coughs> About 15 lines down in the first place. All the attention your master. Mm. That's very good, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> Thank you. 
I like this sentence that says, Whoever ye did advance thee, thus far in the mysteries of love by a right and regular progress and contemplation. The, the thrust of it is that, as we were talking about earlier today, that contemplation is the generator yeah. that progresses, that enables you to utilize this spirit to reach these new levels of awareness. Yeah, it certainly there, isn't it? Right. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that in the other text. It's not. Why don't we sketch it out for them in the first place? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Thank you. It certainly anchors it in the realm of being, doesn't it? Thomas Taylor. Mm -hmm. Very good. He anchors mm -hmm. it into being. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to read from here? In the in first one. Read it? From in the or first part? In the first place, it never had a beginning. Uh, well, then, wait a minute, wait a minute, line above it, sentence above it. What page whoever. Do you want? Yeah, whoever. Whoever, whoever is. First, the two typing. That's where we left off. Yeah. In the first place. <laughs> okay. With you. Where do you want to read from? Whoever? Yeah. Let me, let me look at this in our script. I'm going to type over here. I knocked this out. I had, had not any sleep. Paul came over and we partake in some libation. <laughs> we barely got this. Oh, by the time the typing room closed, that good. So it's scorting enough. Um, so let me. Carol, why don't you read it? You read it so well. <laughs> that's that's what I'm doing. Right. I'll look at the tailor where you're doing that. Okay. Expression. Yeah, because that was one whole place that I didn't read so well. Whoever really? then advances thus far in the mysteries of love by a right and regular progress in, on contemplation, approaching now to perfect intuition. Suddenly, he will discover, bursting into view, a beauty astonishingly admirable. That very beauty, to the gaining a sight of which the aim of all his preceding studies and labors had been directed. A beauty whose peculiar characters are these. And then we go in the first place. Yeah. Uh, someone have a, a, a rouse? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, just notice the way it differs. Mm -hmm. It takes the relativity, it just smacks the relativity right out of it, doesn't it? Whoever shall be guided so far towards the mysteries of love by contemplating beautiful things rightly in due order is approaching the last grade. Suddenly he will behold a beauty marvelous in its nature. That very beauty, Socrates, for the sake of which all the earlier hardships had been born. Do it again, Carol. Okay, this is Roush. Yeah. Whoever shall be guided so far towards the mysteries of love by contemplating beautiful things rightly in due order is approaching the last grade. Suddenly he will behold a beauty marvelous in its nature, that very beauty, Socrates, for the sake of which all the earlier hardships had been born. And then it starts in the first place. Go ahead. Go ahead, look in the first place. Yeah. Out of Thomas Taylor? No. Okay. Ah. Quick. I Mm -hmm. Do you have any? I just, I just spilled my coffee. I'm okay. I'm up. 
in the first place, it never, never, it never had a beginning, nor will ever have an end, but always is, and always flourishes in perfection, unsusceptible of growth or of decay. That's a very interesting difference, but it's even more astonishing the next line. In the next place, it is not beautiful only when looked at one way mm -hmm. or seen in one light, that was real good, huh? right? At the same time that viewed in another way or seen in some other light, it is far from being beautiful. It's not beautiful only at certain times or with reference only to certain circumstances of things. Being at other times or when things are otherwise circumscribed, quite the contrary. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that just takes the whole relativity right out, doesn't it? sure it? does. And the subjective, doesn't it? And a beautiful language. To anyone. Yeah. yeah. Anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, take the first part. Notice this difference. In the first place, rather? And Rouse? In the first place, everlasting, and never being born or perishing, neither increasing nor diminishing. Sure. That's, That's very weak compared to what he found. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Always so. is. I mean, this is rich. Never had a beginning, nor will, nor, and nor, nor will ever have an end, but always is. That's highlighted is, right? He's really mm -hmm. talking about being. And always flourishes in perfection. I mean, that's mm -hmm. beautiful, isn't it? Very continuous, nice. a continuous, nice. continuous flourishing and perfection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's translated. Like unsusceptible of growth. Of now, look what he does now. Take Rouse, please. Mm -hmm. Continue Rouse. Okay. Secondly, not beautiful here and ugly there. Now, now notice this language here. It gets to be cut and dried. Uh, it's also repetitive. You'll see yes. there's a key part that repeats itself, and it looks like Plato stumbled. You're right. Huh? Rich yes. yeah. uh, secondly, not beautiful here and ugly there, not Re beautiful now and ugly then. Repetition. Well, we have place and time. Yeah. Not beautiful in one direction and ugly in another direction. Repetitious, he said. Not beautiful in one place and ugly in another place. So there's... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But Thomas Taylor takes the whole subjective element out of it, doesn't he, in the relativistic? Mm -hmm. In the next place, it is not beautiful only when looked at one way or seen in one light. At the same time, that viewed in another way or seen in some other light it is far from being beautiful. It's not beautiful only at certain times or with reference only to certain circumstances of things being at other times or when other things are otherwise circumscribed, quite contrary. In contrast to a lover looking at his beloved. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. In the morning as compared to the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> or evening, right. Or when loaded or whatever. Yeah. You said that too quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we, they, that, that doesn't come through in the rounds. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Far more interesting. Consistent. Yeah, go ahead. Again, this beauty will not show itself to him like a face or hands or any bodily thing at all, nor as a discourse or a science. Now look what he does. Mm -hmm. Nor can this beauty, which is indeed no other than the beautiful itself, ever be the object of imagination. <laughs> as if it had some face or hands of its own, or any other parts belonging to body. Mm -hmm. Nor is it some particular reason, nor some particular science. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? you, you have to infer more from, from uh, Rouse. Right? You don't see it as a face or hands, nor is it. Mm -hmm. no. yeah. Yeah, could you do that line again? Yes. Again, this beauty will not show itself to him 
like a face or hands or any bodily thing at all, nor as a discourse or a science, in earth or heaven or anything else, no, no, nor as a discourse or a science, nor indeed as residing in anything, as in a living creature or it's or in earth or heaven or anything else, but being by itself with itself, always in simplicity, while all the beautiful things elsewhere partake of this beauty in such a manner that when they are born and perish, it becomes neither less nor more, and nothing at all happens to it. Yeah. So, all right. mm -hmm. It resides not in any other being, in any other being. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not in any animal, for instance, nor in the earth, nor in the heavens, nor in any animal, for instance. Nor in any yeah. other part of the universe. But simple, separate from other things. It subsists alone with itself and possesses an essence eternally uniform. <coughs> Much more better fit metaphysics. That the essence eternally uniform you get from uh, monoidates. <coughs> Is this? Synonymous with the one. The in that the word other is used, does, does that suggest that it is be has being and is in a part of the universe? Mm -hmm. It says it resides not in any other being. Yeah. Does that suggest that it does? Yeah, okay. I, yeah. yeah. And other part of the universe, so it does have location in the universe. A little further down, uh, it says, nor in any animal, nor in the earth, nor in the heavens, nor in any other part of the universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do that Is that referring, back? Yeah. Is yeah. That referring back to what came yeah, prior? Yeah, do the rest. Finish the thought. Yeah. It subsists alone with itself. Yeah. yeah. Are you reading from the but, but simple, simple and separate from other things? Yeah. Here. This sounds like a, it's a description of the one is all. Yeah, it has except many parallels. Except that well, is it the one doesn't have existence. Yeah, and it doesn't right, exist. Does that mean it doesn't right. exist in any part of the universe? So is it a derivative of one? It doesn't yeah. exist in the Being part. Being mm -hmm. equivalent or synonymous with intelligence? Yes. All right, now he has the participation right there. Okay. Okay, all other forms which are of beauty is participate of this, but in such a manner that that um, in such a manner they participate, that by their generation or destruction this suffers no diminution, receives no addition, nor undergoes any kind of alteration. All right, yours is the Rouse. The Rouse is. While all the beautiful things elsewhere partake of this beauty in such manner, that when they are born and perish, it becomes neither less nor more, and nothing at all happens to it. Yeah. So that when anyone by right boy loving goes up from these beautiful things to that beauty. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Taylor has both sexes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but yeah. on the previous section it's specifically it was specifically yeah. female. female. Yeah. Mm -hmm. An interesting difference. Went from these lower beauties reascending 
by the right way of love, a man begins to get a sight of the supreme beauty. He must have almost attained somewhat of his end. Now to go or to be led by another along the right way of love is this. And then he has the recapitulation. Mm -hmm. uh, this one stresses much more Platonic image of the arts, disciplines, than the Ras. Mm -hmm. Like, would you be doing the same thing if you were following the course of studies outlined in the Rouse as compared to the Thomas? Well, I wanted to read Thomas. I'm uh, pardon me, the uh, Rouse. Okay. The, uh, for let me tell you. Yeah. For let me tell you the right way to approach the things of love, or to be led there by another, is this. Beginning from these beautiful things, to mount for that beauty's sake ever upwards as by a flight of steps, from one to two, and from two to all beautiful bodies, and from beautiful bodies to beautiful pursuits and practices, and from practices to beautiful learnings, so that from learnings he may come at last to that perfect learning, which is the learning solely of that beauty itself, and may know at last that which is the perfection of beauty there in life and there alone my dear Socrates said the inspired woman is the life worth living for man while he contemplates beauty itself if ever you see this it will seem to you to be far above goal and raiment and beautiful boys and men whose beauty you are now entranced to see and you and many others are ready so long as they see their darlings and remain ever with them, if it could be possible, not to eat or drink, but only to gaze at them and to be with them. What indeed, said she, should we think, if it were given to one of us to see beauty undefiled, pure, unmixed, not adulterated with human flesh and colors, and much other mortal rubbish, and if we could behold beauty in perfect simplicity. Do you think it a mean life for a man, said she, to be looking thither and contemplating that and abiding with it? Do you not reflect, said she, that there only it will be possible for him when he sees the beautiful with the mind which alone can see it, to give birth not to likenesses of virtue, since he touches no likeness, but to realities, since he touches reality, and when he has given birth to real virtue and brought it up, will it not be granted to him to be the friend of God and immortal if any man ever is? Has a question about whether a man is a man is. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why don't you read? Why don't you read there? Now to go. Just be getting true virtue. No, how about now to go or to be led by another? Third from the bottom. Over on the left hand side, Nancy. About fifteen or twenty one seconds. The first the first thing the word is in. Oh, okay. Now to go or be led by another along the right way of love is this. Beginning from those beauties of lower rank to proceed in a continual ascent. All the proposing this highest beauty as the end and using the rest but as so many steps in the ascent to proceed from one to two from two to all the beauteous bodies from the beauty of bodies to that of souls from the beauty of souls to that of arts right. from, the, 
from the beauty of arts to that of disciplines, until at length from the disciplines he arrives at the discipline which is the discipline of no other thing than that of supreme beauty. See, that's very clearly stages, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mark, the language, everything there. Yeah. And thus finally attains to know what is the beautiful itself. Here is to be found, dear Socrates, said, said the stranger, prophetess. Here of anywhere the happy life, the ultimate object of desire to man. It is to live in beholding this consummate beauty, the sight of which, if ever you attain, it will appear not to be in gold, nor in magnificent attire, nor in beautiful youths or damsels. With such, however, at present, many of you are so entirely taken up and with the sight of them so absolutely charmed that you would rejoice to spend your whole lives, were it possible, in the presence of those enchanting objects, without any thoughts of eating or drinking, but feasting your eyes only with their beauty and living always in the bare side of it. If this be so, what effect, think you, would the sight of beauty itself have upon a man, were he to see it pure and genuine, not corrupted and stained all over with the mixture of flesh, and colors, and much more of like perishing and fading trash. We were able to view that divine essence, the beautiful itself, in its own simplicity of form. Thank you, said she, that the life of such a man would be contemplated for me, for the man who always directed his eye toward the right object who looked always at real beauty and was conversant with it continually? Perceive ye not, said she, that in beholding the beautiful with that eye, with which alone it is possible to behold it, thus and only thus could a man ever attain to generate not the images or semblances of virtue, as not having this intimate commerce with an image or a semblance, but virtue, true, real, and substantial and the converse and embraces of that which is real and true. That's a big difference in there. And the rouse, you, you nearly have to pull it out uh, nearly by inference. It's such a close reading. It touches reality. Could you do that? Line? Someone have the uh, Rousey nearby? Mm -hmm. You think it a mean life for a man, she said, to be looking thither and contemplating that and abiding with it? Do you not reflect, said she, that? There only it will be possible for him when he sees the beautiful with the mind, which alone can see it, to give birth not to likenesses of virtue, since he touches no likeness, but to realities, since he touches reality. And when he has given birth to real virtue and brought it up, will it not be granted him to be the friend of God and immortal? if any man ever is. Wouldn't you agree there's likely to be some difference in the Greek between embracing that which is real and yeah. true and touching? Right? Touching real. Right? Yeah. Whoops. Right. Touch can be good. Yeah, that's one heck of a difference. And then the uh, the whole problem of nurturing. It's very clear in mm -hmm. time. Right. And bringing her up till she is grown and sure. About the corresponding line of the Yeah. Broadly. When he has 
given birth to real virtue and brought, and brought it, it out. That's it. Brought it That's out. That's it. Um, mm-hmm. No. And here is bringing her up till she is grown mature. And the conclusion. <coughs> favor of the gods that length would be if any man uh, would. Yourself mm-hmm. and kind of the immortals. That fits with that preceding two paragraphs. So, let me sketch out the steps. Let's sketch out the steps. Five eleven. then enters upon this great affair in a proper manner and begins according to a right method, must have been from his earliest view of conversing with bodies that are beautiful. It's a precondition. Prepared by this acquaintance with you, he must in the first place get his leader lead a right, fall in love with some one particular person, fair and beauteous. And on her you get fine sentiments and fair discourse. Is that fair like in just? Beauty. beauty. Well, why would it be beauty and beauteous? I haven't got the faintest idea. must afterwards consider that the beauty of outward form, that which he admires so highly in his favorite fair one, is sister to a beauty of the same kind, which he cannot but see in some other fair. If he can then pursue this corporeal beauty and trace it wherever it's to be found, throughout the human species. Oh, that's right. I must want understanding not to conceive that beauty is one. The same thing of all beauteous colors. With this conception in, in his mind, he must become a lover of all visible forms, which are takers of this beauty. And in consequence of this general love, he must moderate the excess of that passion for one only female form, which had hitherto engrossed him wholly. For he cannot now entertain thoughts extravagantly high of the beauty of any particular fair one, the beauty not particular to her, but which she partakes of in common with all other corporeal forms of the beauty. That's that's a reasoning, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Right. That's a, that's missing entirely in us. After this, if he thinks rightly and knows to estimate the value of things justly, he will esteem that beauty which is inward and lies deep in the soul to be of greater value and worthy of more regard than that which is outward and adorns of the body. Right, that's a result of thinking rightly and estimating and esteeming. As soon, therefore, 
as he meets with a person of the beauty of soul and generous nature, though flowering forth by the little and superficial beauty, with this little, he's satisfied. He has all he wants. He truly loves and assiduously employs all his thoughts and all his care on the object of his affection. And that's uh, so much clearer than Ram's, isn't it? Huh? Eminently clear. Mm -hmm. Researching in his mind and memory, he draws forth, he generates such notions of things, such reasonings and discourses, and they best improve his beloved and virtue. Wow, like he's doing a lot of researching in his mind, reflectively, and memory. Draws for it. He's getting birth, isn't it? Draws for it. That sounds like that section of the Phaedrus, you know, they search for themselves. Yeah, yeah. It's that same, same. Mm -hmm. He draws for it. He generates such notions of things, such reasonings and discourses. He's pulling out of himself, saying, hey, look going into his own experience, his own memory, sharing that. <coughs> Thus he arrived, of course, to view beauty in the arts. So before you go on, um, there's a, in the that sentence it says, may best improve his beloved in virtue. Yeah. Does that mean that he is giving birth to ideas that this person that he loves, or you know, not the beauty itself? So we're on beauty in the soul. Yes, at but this point. true. He's he, he's not the only one in this higher pursuit. He's now pulling her in. Yeah. Is that the force of it? Bringing the best out of himself to... Yeah. To improve... Improve, educate, uh, yeah. bring somebody else along. Okay. But, yeah. Thus he arrives, of course, to view beauty in the arts, the subjects of discipline and study. All right, so he's moving beauty in the arts, subjects of discipline and study. Ah, when it comes to discover that beauty is congenial in them all. You see people at Golden West College like that. They go out of the science building, the art building, and they go, oh my God, it's the same kind of beauty I found in my last course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. We do that all the time. Yeah. yeah. Now there, you now therefore accounts all beauty corporeal to be of mean and inconsiderable value, as being but a small and inconsiderable part of beauty. For the arts, he proceeds further to the sciences, and he holds beauty no less in these. It's certainly progression, isn't it? What's the distinction between the arts and the sciences? Well, that depends on Well, how. here's a footnote, maybe it'll help. The sciences are meant to term of mathematical. In, in English, you know, isn't the, the science an organized body of knowledge? You know, like uh, <coughs> painting. Yeah. Is that an organized body of knowledge? <laughs> 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 it's not anything I'm saying. <laughs> Easy. I'm flat. I'm flat. Right. I'm okay. playing with your definition. That it's broad enough to include many things. Fred, thank you. 
bread, bread making. making. Anything that included knowledge at all would fall into that, right? An organized body. Well, I think the thing is, is there any way to nail it down any closer? Or is that it? <coughs> Anything that's an organized <coughs> body is <coughs> knowledge. One. So, yeah. yeah, I think the footnote will help you there, Paul, the bottom of 512. Arithmetic, geometry, music, and its theory and astronomy. Mm -hmm. That's normally called science. Is it limited to that? No, that's, okay. that's how limited their science was. No, it's not limited to that. The science is here meant for those what is art, to What is art in contrast to science? <coughs> Pardon? Art. In the context of this dialogue, not the context of mine. Would it be different? Uh, That's my question. Yeah. Well, in Ximachus' um, speech, he's the physician, and he calls his work an art. That's what I wanted to bring out, that, you know, you can have a science, but there's a way of utilizing it without being exact knowledge in such a way as to perform it. That's right. Art, art is the use to which you put knowledge. That's my yeah. point I'm trying to establish, and I think that's what you're driving at there. Yeah, yeah. In reference to this dialogue. No. The modern use of the word arts would be professions. Right. That is, it has to have a service, it has to serve the subject. Well, in medicine, we call it the art and science, or the healing arts. Yes. You know, we don't, <coughs> we're not, every day the knowledge is, is different. Every day it changes, new information is coming along all the time. So we have to utilize what we have and we do it in the best possible way, which is an art. Right. No, no that's why you practice. We practice. <laughs> 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 and by this time, right, having seen, and now considering with himself that beauty is manifold and various, no There's so many words in here for uh, contemplative practice, considering, reflecting. You know, those kinds of words. I seem to to stand out more in this translation. Well, that's, yes, that's quite true. Considering Which, within himself, it is read there again. No. Yeah. Um, if you pick it up from here, there's a whole section that's in Ras that's not in Taylor. That pursuits and customs and yeah, that has always thrown me customs. Right? Well, I've never understood isn't that. Isn't that? I mean, isn't that what he he's saying here from arts and sciences? Oh, uh, you might Pursuit regard it that way, but I, I think it would be difficult to find out that could come out of the same word. Right? Like pursuits and customs. Well, Sarah was pointing out the word he uses there for art is this particular word uh, on the footnote there. After the name's side? Is that what it is? Yeah. 
Does that movement that he's doing for pursuits and practices? I've been there doing this at uh, home because I've never seen that. I was curious as to if he uses that word of the Republic because Taylor seems to be, well, aside from this is aside from him, but no. He seems to be picking up on the uh, that distinction between uh, techne and all forms of dianoia, and that he talks about just before the studies in the Republic, he wants to find that which is common to all of them. Remember that? Mm -hmm. That seems to the tailors come off that. I don't recall that word being used there. Though. The word that they got for um, lost it again. The word that you were asking about um, from the arts, he proceeds further to the sciences at the bottom of five twelve. Yeah. Right. And, uh, where he says up further, he says beauty in the arts. Mm -hmm. That word is. In fact, uh, epithe doima, coming from a verb, and in fact, coming from a word which originally means for a special purpose, um, on purpose, designedly, and artfully. And then it goes to the verb, which means to pursue or practice something. Mm, and then the noun that, that's being used here is that which one pursues one's pursuit in life, one's business, one's custom, one's practice. That's how they got it. Oh, the pursuit, practice yeah. of the custom. Yeah, practice. It's the practice, not the custom itself. Right. I suspect that's used in Parmenides, where they refer to Agathon, who pursued this, but now he pursues. Or is this like. I mean, there was <coughs> the stamos, which you might think that he goes to. From arts to sciences, that's at the stamos. The second which commonly is translated knowledge as but you know science may be a pure truth. Yeah. I'm on the fifth line on the type sheet. But betaking himself to the ample sea of beauty and surveying it with the eye of intellect, he begets many beautiful and magnificent reasonings and dianoic conceptions and prolific philosophy, to have been strengthened and increased, perceives what the one science is, which is so singularly great, as to be the science. That's epistemic. One science. Oh, is this the word? Is this the word? Why do you have to fix me? Two of them, you could probably come up with a nice one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Preserve the virtues of both. Intuition, a perfect intuition. 
comes that way, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Not in time. Only when the light comes on. It, it, comes it, it, on. First thing into view. Not it hurts. Not it hurts. Not it hurts. Yeah. You know where you have put in question that essence possesses an essence eternal and uniform? Yeah. That, it's, you know, it's about a little plus halfway down that page. That's um, really kind of nice. It does have mono edits in it, the one form, mono edit, but it's also uh, auto, auto, cath auto, auto, uh -huh. it's self by itself. Uh -huh. by itself. Um, self by itself kind of with itself. There's, uh, auto, cath, cath auto, meta auto, mono edis, and then the word for always and the word for being. Uh -huh. On. Uh -huh. So just, there is then a word for being. For being, being itself by itself always exists. In one form or one. That's not bad. Oh, that's really not like you work. Yeah. 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 In any event, that sentence says, in this book, suddenly he will discover first thing to do a beauty astonishingly admirable. That very beauty to gain a sight of which the aim of all the preceding studies and labors have been directed. And in this book, it says, suddenly you will behold a beauty marvelous in its nature. It seems like it's a little weaker in this book by just making that statement. Because that bursting into view yeah. has a movement, an action, sure. that is much more dynamic than what is just saying he will behold. Yeah, this, this is uh, much more attentive to the human dimension. Uh, Reflective dimension. Stages. That word epitadema that he's doing mm -hmm. with arts here, all the way through in the Republic, he develops this word practice, as you recall. Yeah. That's different from the studies. Yeah. And that's the word epitadema. Oh, that's definitely That turned out to be a different. It looked like an old familiar uh, epitadema. <laughs> That's what precedes the arts yeah. <coughs> in the Republic. The practice. Ah. Ah, that sounds familiar. <laughs> All right. <coughs> well, thank you for the, those of you who worked on this. Ken, and was Ken uh, Paul and Rod? Paul, and Rod. <coughs> Paul offered the question <coughs> and dragged me through this. <laughs> well, I'm glad he dragged to, it. To my, to my enjoyment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah good. Carol, what time do you have? 10 after 12. Ah, overtime! <laughs> oh. hey. Pay the man, pay the man. Time and a half. That's real fun. Yeah, yeah when's bad. Yeah. Can we get another... The page the out, of, out of your work, Rod, to uh, The 14 and the 9, sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll make those some other time. Make some yeah. copies of those. Yeah, maybe. sometime. Maybe try to have it for next week. Yeah. And uh, Rod is going to uh, Xerox some, some sections out of Propolis and Plotinus on the uh, inward side of those people's journey, the contemplative side of practices and exercises. Mm -hmm. We're going to duplicate them and pass them out. Hmm. What, what next week, Rod? Uh, I'll try for that. Yes. Well, I'll get the extra page. Yeah. There's a page that's screwed up. One zero oh, oh, okay. And one page. Yes, has oh, a page. Yeah. Yeah. Not a book review. Go on. No. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking for the book review. I thought I missed it. I have an extra day off.